Hey, what's up everybody? It's Stephen A. Williams with The Credit Repair Shop. And in today's video, we're gonna talk about court summons. We're gonna talk about responding to them. And also if the worst thing that could happen that you end up losing and they try to garnish your wages or they try to freeze your bank account. We have a lot of uh, YouTube subscribers asking questions. Uh, we get a lot of emails. And so I think that this video will be very, very informative to help you with, if you have a potential uh, lawsuit or you even have a debt collector who is attempting to collect a debt and maybe they have pro probably threatened that they could take legal action, but they haven't outright said that they're gonna sue you, but they just said that legal action, legal action is an option. Now, something that I did not used to see well, I won't say I didn't used to see. We saw it in the past, and it seemed like it's coming back around, is that debt collection companies were not trying to sue people for smaller debts. It was usually, I would say, $2,500 or more, and then they would take them to court. But we're starting to see debt collectors that are suing people for debts that are lower than $2,500. There was one that came across our debts for $1,300 and $850. And the reasons why I believe that they're doing that is because more and more people are disregarding the court summons and not showing up. And they're like, hey, we could just start pushing this out again because people are not responding and we could start winning these cases uh, at a higher level because uh, companies like mine who would respond would uh, have been winning a lot of cases, but also uh, because of some of the issues that happened where the CFPB or the FTC uh, sued some of the debt collection companies for violating individuals' rights with robo-signing, so to speak, or robo-producing these court summons without all of the proof, uh, the courts kind of start got a little worried and said, hey, did some, you know, is this uh, a complete action? Has it been reviewed or is this just something that was just uh, put together by, uh, you know, AI or something? I don't know what, what was it, come to think of it, when they say robo sign and all of that, was, that was technically, wasn't that AI? Wasn't that AI? You, you know, when I see a court summons, I can see one that was done by AI and I can see one that's like, um, that was actually, had took, the uh, attorney, the plaintiff attorney took a lot of time to put that court action together. I can see it just by reading it. You can tell which one is uh, was put together that way. Uh, so this is what happens when a, a debt collection companies, when they're looking at trying to, they really, they, the, the way that they're trying to really push now is the levy bank accounts. Yes, they, they'll go for garnishments, but they're gonna look at both options. So you got to be very careful. So the first thing they're going to do is they're going to get, uh, they're going to file a, a lawsuit and they're going to notify you that they're filing a lawsuit. So they would have probably been sending you messages uh, in the mail, sending you letters in the mail or calling you over and over. They have to send that letter in the mail. Uh, but then after that, calling you and saying, hey, if you don't resolve this, uh, we might have to take legal action. And then it's just got to that point where they're going to take legal action and they're going to do a civil lawsuit. In a civil lawsuit, you have a right to represent yourself in a civil lawsuit. Uh, if you are you also in other you know, criminal lawsuits, you have a right, but most people won't. Uh, but in a civil lawsuit, this is something where you have a right to represent yourself. Because if you think about it, if you can't afford an attorney and then you, ha you, you have someone suing you for money and you already can't pay them, how are you going to be able to afford to pay an attorney? So what you want to do is you want to put yourself in a position and, and, and of the understanding that you can represent yourself. But now when when first thing that comes to people's mind is like, okay, I, I know I can represent myself, but what do I say? How do I say it? Who do I say it to? Do I say it to the judge? Do I got to be up in there like, like I'm uh, on law and order, like they, all of these things come come to people's mind. It's probably coming to your, to your mind if you have an issue. No, what you have to do is you write your response to the allegations that's on your court summons. The difference is, is that you have to know 
how to say it. Well, you got to know what to say in response and you have to know how to say it. That's what really makes the difference between winning and losing in these court summons, uh, civil court uh, cases is that like, even if you had an attorney and your attorney uh, gave a response and it was like, what the, what the hell is that? Like we've all heard where people would say like, my attorney just didn't represent me the right way. Or, you know, it, it, that basically comes down to like, you got to build a story around what you're responding to. So if, uh, let's just say, for example, they say that you had this account number that, uh, with, that ended in 4289 and they didn't put the rest of the uh, account numbers. Wouldn't it be reasonable to request the unredaction of the full account number? Would that be reasonable in your eyes? Wouldn't it be reasonable to be able to review that complete account number so you can review it against the uh, account that they're claiming that it is? What if you had multiple accounts? It's not about running from the debt. It's about getting all of the information so you can make a full decision. So if you're speaking or let's not speaking, because I know that that scares a lot of a lot of people. If you're if you write in your response to the court and to that debt collector that you need to get all of that information so you can understand, number one, is this the account that you can recollect from from the information they're providing you is incomplete? So you want complete information. And if you are the owner of this debt, you should have complete information. So just think about just that, like just that statement. Wouldn't that be logical for any judge to just say, hey, let's get everything so we can move forward on this case? Because I don't think that it looks good on a case to have partial documentation. I don't think that it looks good for a case to have some of an account number. And to, to, to say that a, a judge would allow something to move forward without it being, if it was questioned, now if it wasn't questioned, you know, it, it can move forward. But if it's questioned, if it is questioned, I believe that every judge that reviewed it would say, just get the complete account number. Because this is getting everything to prove their case. So if you're trying to prove your case, you got a few statements, you got a little bit of this stuff, a little bit of that stuff. Some of the stuff may not be complete. Some of this stuff here, it, it, it does not look clear. And then you have an account number that is not showing a full account number for review. Why don't we just go ahead and get all of that information before we make a decision on this case? That is the position. That's like saying it in a way that is logical. That's saying it in a way that allows you to have the opportunity to win. That's just one example. And you can look at all of the documents in your court summons uh, complaint. And, and you can look at each one of those. And you can probably find a way to challenge that document. There's several ways to challenge those documents, but moving forward, so that what they're gonna do is they're gonna get a, have a civil lawsuit. And then if they get a judgment, if you lose and they get a judgment, this is one of the things that stops people from actually trying to win a case is that they just think mo most about what's going to potentially happen rather than let's just work up. And if that does happen, then I can deal with it when that does happen. Even if you, file your response and you lose your case, you will still have the opportunity to make a settlement with that debt collector. And if the if you can't afford the settlement that they're offering, which in most cases, that w when you are in court and you ask for time to speak with them, the judge is gonna really push on that plaintiff attorney or that debt collector to resolve that matter that they don't wanna see them come back in there. That, I've seen that personally myself from being in, in court. But if they get the judgment, you do nothing. What they're going to do is they're going to come back to court and they're going to seek an order. And in that order, they're going to get a new order with their specific request that they're either going to want to garnish your wages or they're going to want to freeze your bank account to get money out of your bank account for what you have. Now, 
in the past, this was this uh, strategy that the debt collection companies were using was mainly used on businesses. And then I saw an uptick where this was was starting to be used in states that did not allow garnishments, like the state of Texas does not allow garnishment of wages. But guess what happens a lot in the state of Texas that they freeze bank accounts and then they take the money out of that bank account. So don't think that this isn't an option that they may take. And in, in, in actuality, in all 50 states, they're allowed to freeze bank accounts but it's in, in states that allow garnishments, from what I understand, is that the judge would like to not have it go into the bank account unless it's a high dollar amount. So if you owe a couple of thousand dollars, they're going to push for them to do uh, garnishment of your wages. And again, you always have the option to settle. Even if you're getting garnished, you had an option to get that reduced. All you have to do is contact the plaintiff attorney or if it's the uh, uh, the uh, direct original creditor, you can call them and say, this is putting me under even a more stressful hardship than I was already under. And I would like to renegotiate that uh, that payment arrangement that, that the uh, court put in place, which would normally be 25%, 25% of, of your disposable income. And there is a garnishment worksheet that most states will have people fill out. Most people don't fill it out, so they're just gonna take the top amount, but you may not even be eligible for them to even be able to take 25% uh, of your wages. It might be a reduced amount based on dependence, based on income, based on your status, maybe you're a veteran. You just never know. There could be s several exemptions that you might have other than the overall exemptions that will just exempt you from being garnished, period. And I have videos that talk about those. So now, if you happen to get your money taken out of your bank account, let me give you some things that you could look at to get your money back. Number one and uh, is you need to check your exemptions. They're, you know, because people don't know their rights, because people don't understand that you can be exempt. And also, also, because I know about this, is that you, you people get emotional. People get very emotional. So I would say that what you should do is if you have a garnishment or you have a, a they've taken your money out of your account, is that you have to kind of calm down a little bit. I know that that sounds easier said than done, but you have to just kind of like, just take deep breath and then you have to start strategizing on what your next move will be. Uh, so check your exemptions. A lot of people are exempt. And the only reason why they had their money taken is because they never did respond to it, to the initial summons. They never even notified the uh, plaintiff attorney. If you are exempt and they are taking you to court, the first thing that I would do is to just notify them of your exemption. They might still go ahead and go through with the court case, but I've seen, depending on your exemptions, depending on your exemptions, they may not even go through with the court case because they know that they will never be able to collect on that debt. The next thing is that uh, you can request to vacate the judgment. So if you got a default judgment, it, you have a certain period of time where you can go back to the court, fill out documents, submit it, and you can have the court vacate the judgment. If it was a default judgment, if you did not let it go past the period period of time for your state, for your area, you will be able to get that reopened. Most courts will allow default judgments to be reopened and then you must uh, respond to the initial court summons to be able to uh, get that reopened. Well, when you get it reopened. The next thing is that you can request release due to economic hardship. And another thing is that they must leave money for living expenses. Now, so you might be saying, well, why didn't they leave money? They should know that. They should know the rules. They're not going to just know what your living expenses are. They're not going to know uh, that, you know, if you had $5,000 in there that you needed to pay your mortgage, your car, and your all of that stuff. They're not going to it, they're not going to pay attention to that. They're just going to take all of the money. And then it's going to be up to you to go and get the money back. This is just the game that they play. 
This is just the game that they play. So if you if they uh, garnish your bank account, take your money. You got to have to look at the rules in your area. But everyone that we've told to do this, they've always either got some of their money back or even all of their money back. And they made the debt collection firm go through another process to follow the rules about how much money they would have to leave in there. And really, when you get that going, the debt collection company is going to be more of the mindset of, hey, let's just come to some type of a payment arrangement or some agreement because they're going to know that you understand the laws on them being able to just come and take money out of your account. But if you do nothing, if you do nothing, they're going to just dip in there. They're going to keep taking that letter to the bank and the bank is just going to freeze. Anytime you put money in there, just going to freeze it and they're going to just send that money off right over there to the debt collection company. So if you have any situation like this, please contact my office. We can get you some information on how we can either help you or how you can help yourself so you can be able to work your way through this, uh, your financial hardship situation. If you need help with your credit, please visit us at thecreditrepairshop.com. Watch the video, What Makes Us Different, so you can see my eight-point validation process and my two-phase settlement process. If you need your credit reports and scores, go to the website yordernumber3scores.com to grab your TransUnion, Equifax, Experian, credit reports, and all three scores. If you have debt collectors coming after you early in the game, grab my three-pack of letters. Statute of limitations letter for debt that is passed, the legal statute of limitations to collect, and yes, debt collectors are still doing that. Debt validation letter and cease and desist collection activities letter. I do ask for a donation for those letters, but you do not have to give one. It just it has opportunity to save you a lot of time, money, and frustration. Those letters will work. Thank you for your time. Please subscribe to the channel. Post your questions and comments. This is Steven.